Hello, Internet, and welcome to the Collective Arcana. We are a channel all about tabletop gaming. My name is Wyatt, and today we're going to talk about Pathfinder's second edition, Lost Omens, Monsters of Myth. Hi, everybody. Sorry for uh, being MIA. Uh, today we're going to be talking about, as I said, a, a very awesome book. This one is, I'll go ahead and say it up front, uh, this is probably my favorite Lost Omens book released yet, um, and we'll get into to why as we go forward a little bit, but um, it's, I, I definitely recommend you pick it up. It's one of those that, again, even if you're not playing uh, second edition, there's a lot of stuff in there for you besides just monster stat blocks. So what is in there? Exactly. Well, monster stat blocks, for one. Uh, but uh, the big thing is that whereas a bestiary, you know, the three that we've had so far, uh, typically you're focusing on a getting as many monsters out to you, the dungeon master, or the game master, rather, as possible, as quickly as possible, this is much more like a slow jams sort of situation. So what you're getting is 20 monsters versus the two to three, maybe more, <laughs> per book that the bestiaries were doing. But rather than in the bestiaries, each monster getting about a paragraph or so, if that, um, of coverage on, you know, what type of monster they are, where they live, that sort of thing, the ecology. Um, you know, some of them, of course, do have a little more to them. Dragons always get, you know, big spreads and stuff. But for the most part, most monsters are lucky to get an entire page to themselves, let alone two pages. In this, every monster is getting about five or six pages, some a little bit more, so that they can go in deep, not just on the monster stats. That's not taking up any more room than it used to. Uh, you know, about a page, half a page sort of thing, depending on how high level the monster is typically or how complicated its abilities are. But the rest of those pages are going to be giving you not just lore, not just, you know, in-universe lore, but also plot hooks, ways that this creature might plague a town, or uh, how you might notice that, you know, how the players might be able to figure out that this is the creature they're after. Uh, myths and artifacts and, like, rare, you know, like, books and things that you can drop in your game when you're going to be using these monsters. Uh, what that means is that each of these monsters is not just a monster. Each of these monsters is a sort of little mini campaign on its own. Uh, certainly some of them you could build up to and use as the primary monster of an entire campaign, absolutely, but they're not all super high level, and I really like that. I was sort of expecting when it was announced that, you know, with Fafner on the cover here, um, which is, you know, nice... Um, I has never uh, been shy about uh, stealing from real-world myths and legends, and I'm a big fan of that. Um, so, you know, with Fafnir on the cover, I was expecting these were all going to be huge, you know, level at least like 18, you know, late game, big bad monsters. And they're not. Some of them are very low level. I think I think one of them might be as low as level three. Um, I don't remember the exact levels, but but they're very low. So you could, if you wanted to, just use this as like a blueprint and just run your players through all of these monsters each one is as like a big long case, you know, figure out what this monster is, how it works, and, and go kill it, you know, sort of thing. And you could do that, or you could just pepper them in, or again, use them as sort of, you know, sub-bosses along the way th to your regular campaign. Um, but there's so much detail here, um, and not just, you know, stat blocks and lore, but there's, uh, and, you know, not just fluff, but there's also really cool mechanics too. There's uh, special weapons and items uh, that you will need to defeat these creatures. Um, storied sort of items that they might, dr might drop when they're killed, and that's pretty cool. But in addition to all that, it's also got uh, whole events and, you know, like rituals and uh, things like that. So, so not just the monster itself, but, you know, learning about the monster can be an entire quest line within your within your game that your players have to run through. Uh, you know, ancient history, current, like, festivals and things, like for the Krampus. Yeah, the Krampus is in here. Um, you know, so so the way that that interacts with, you know, it's a real-world creature based on a real-world holiday that doesn't really exist in Galarian, so they tell you, you know, how the world, or how they're adapting it to fit into Galarian, um, and some of the traditions and stuff that come around, because it is also tied to a big wintry festival, just like the Krampus is in our real world. 
Um, and so that's that's pretty interesting on its own, of course. But each of these uh, creatures is handled, you know, very distinctly as they should be because they are so distinct in and of themselves. Uh, there are there's elder horror and stuff in here, and that's treated very differently than you know the Krampus and stuff like that in terms of uh, you know how you want to to build towards this creature because that's what it's all about. This is a tool for a GM to you know not just be plopping a monster down on a table and telling people to fight it. It's to build tension, to lead into, to telegraph what the players are going to be going up against and the tools around that to really make it feel like more than a monster stat block. One of the examples is the Mosquito Witch, which was... <laughs> which, which? <laughs> which was sort of uh, used for, uh, I believe, a Pathfinder Society scenario, but I don't think that it actually featured there. It was more of a sort of, you know, the Mosquito Witch is around. And I could be wrong. Uh, I didn't play it. Somebody definitely let me know in the comments if I'm wrong about that. Uh, but here we get stats for the Mosquito Witch, as well as tips on how to run the Mosquito Witch for campaigns of different levels, and there's a couple of them that way that sort of, uh, you know, have some ideas for, again, if you're just going to use this as a one, one-time one use monster, or if you want to maybe adjust it a little bit uh, in terms of how it's showing up in your world and build up to it a little bit. Um, so again, so just because a monster's a set level, you can start dropping hints and leading up to that monster at a much earlier level because of the stuff in this book. Uh, there's also the Sandpoint Devil in here, which we've already had a stat block for as well. Um, in, we actually had a whole, you know, adventure in, I think, Rise of the Rune Lords, uh, but we also have a stat block in 2nd edition already. Uh, so what they did here, I'm not going to spoil it, uh, but they have given you as a GM a way to make sure that um, just because the uh, Sandpoint Devil is defeated, um, it's not necessarily gone. It could still be a problem. It could rear its head again in a couple of really interesting ways, one of them that could be very interesting for a player, perhaps. Um, definitely one of the weirder things in the book, so definitely check that out. Uh, one of the other things that I really liked in this book, huge fan, couldn't be a bigger fan of, is, and I, I've read uh, here just because I'm going to say it wrong, the Anamurin. Could be way off there. Anamurin? I could be way off. Um, but what it is, is it's this big, uh, to simplify it down to its most basic terms, it's a big uh, ice monster yeti that is not so much evil as much of it's like a sort of almost like a nature spirit sort of thing um instead of being a big monster you necessarily want to go kill you can there's stats to kill it and that's great <laughs> but uh it also you can make a pact with it and if your player character makes a pact with this big monster uh it essentially allows you to start taking feats and, and a dedication for this sort of pact bound initiate thing that allows you to start to gain a portion of this creature's power. You may think that sounds very similar to a warlock in another game, and it does. It does. It definitely is covering some of that base, and I think um, potentially combined with either, not necessarily on the same character, but maybe just in the party, with a, you know, a witch, one of the cold-themed witches, I think you could really get a a very cool vibe of, you know, something has sent us here and empowered us to do some things, and maybe it's not the best thing. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but it's really cool. It's another approach as opposed to the witch, um, and it does give me a wonder about, we know that the Thaumaturge, the playtest, introduced some other pacts that you could enter into. Those were just like a single feat. They were honestly pretty underwhelming, but there was a big response from the community that they would want those pacts to be... Uh, more open to everyone and a bigger deal. So I think in Dark Archive, we could see more of this. Dark Archive would definitely be the book that would be most fitting for it, um, but we definitely could see some of these pacts and concepts around there of uh, this weird spooky entity is willing to offer you power for a price, um, which was sort of how it was presented in the Thaumaturge, but... Um, Hopefully, again, we're going to get it much more expanded. And I would love to see them use this as the blueprint, because this uh, packed bound initiative, I think, is uh, the term for it. I've just been calling it the Yeti archetype. <laughs> but um, but yeah, so but what that does is it starts you off with just giving you some cold-themed powers, as well as uh, a way to make uh, basically Stalrim, like the ice armor from Skyrim. Uh, but then as you progress, you can like conjure walls of snow right, <laughs> right out of the ground. 
up to and including, I think around level 16, you can become this monster. You still are your character. This is not like a temporary shift, like you become a large-sized uh, one of these monsters. For those keeping score at home, we really only have a few ways to gain permanent size increases and become large-sized creatures in Pathfinder 2nd Edition. All of them come online or after level 15, or no, there might be a level 13 one in Beastkin, actually. Uh, but Beastkin and, uh, I've had them written here, or the Beast Folk, rather. Uh, no, it's Beastkin, uh, which is a versatile heritage, so anybody can take that. Um, and then Lizard Folk and Automaton, I believe, are the only uh, ancestries, Automaton and Lizard Folk, that can allow you to become large. Uh, now, the Barbarian class can uh, become large through a class feature whenever it rages, and there's certainly spells to make you large. But in terms of, this is my character, my character is large. This is now, uh, I believe, only the third way to just walk around large all the time. And it's pretty cool that it's an archetype, because everything else so far has been something that you're going to have to make a big decision about. You either need to be a barbarian and decide early on that you're going to go giant instinct, or you need to be a, a lizard folk or an automaton or a you know, beastkin. These are all decisions you're making about your character at first level. This is something that could potentially uh, come online much later, and it could be a later decision for your character. Um, but I just like, again, that it's something that could be tacked onto any character. It's not the defining part. And that's wild to think about. Oh, my character's a yeti. But I'm mostly, you know, a ranger or whatever. I just also happen to be a yeti and also a dwarf <laughs> or whatever. Um, so I just I just really like that. I, I, I'm staying zoned in on it because I really hope we see more of that. Um, it's very interesting. And we just don't have a lot of archetypes. I think ooze morph. And, uh, and I know we are going to get a lot with the Book of the Dead with the various undead archetypes. Um, so I guess maybe they are going that direction. Uh, but it, I just like it, that it's something that can be that fundamental to your character, where it's not even so much just a set of skills, but it's actually changing your character at a fundamental level like that. And while that's the only um, one that comes with an archetype, there are, again, several that come with uh, new equipment and stuff like that, uh, as well as, you know, not just the monsters presented in this book, but there are also some other monsters that act as sort of underlings to the primary monster. So you're getting a little more than 20, but 20 is a big sell. Um, one other thing that's really cool that I do want to mention um, that, again, sets it apart as a little more different than the rest of the ones in the book are the kaiju. Now, the kaiju are not presented as monsters for you to fight. They are specifically presented as being too big of a challenge, world-shaking, nearly invulnerable, horrific, you know, just... They're the, they're the Tarrasque, they're Godzilla, you know, there's only so much a couple of regular, you know, people can do. Uh, I guess technically they're thought to be more than a Tarrasque, since we do have stats for a Tarrasque and no stats for these kaiju. But, but anyway, um, what it means is that the kaiju are instead presented as a series of hazards, and then it guides you as a GM how to use those to tell a compelling story as if there was actually a monster fight. The best and closest way to describe it would be... Um, something like Shadow of the Colossus, right? Where the creature is the environment that you're fighting instead of just a single sack of hit points that you're trying to drop down. You know, you're having to interact with a dynamic environment in order to defeat the creature. And that's something that, as far as I know, we've really not seen anywhere else, uh, certainly in uh, Pathfinder. Uh, but it's definitely something that you see online a lot. I know that uh, me and my a uh, gamer group and friends have talked about how super cool it would be to have rules for that sort of thing, and we kind of do now. Granted, they're for kaiju, so they're all super high level, but you could take the lessons and the guides and the and the suggestions there uh, to help you create and run and homebrew a much lower level one, so that you could have a whole campaign where, yeah, sometimes we're fighting you know trolls and whatever, and sometimes the big bosses of each arc within our game, we're trying to fight these huge, gigantic colossuses that just cannot be defeated through normal means. And that's a huge chunk of a toolbook for a GM to have. And so when I talked earlier about how there's a lot in here, even if you don't play Pathfinder 2nd Edition, which again, is almost always true with these Lost Omens books, um, even if you're not playing in the Galarian setting or anything like that, uh, they come with a lot of information that you can easily tailored to fit into your homebrew game world or, you know, whatever other setting you're playing in, and enough information for you to 
uh, go off book, off of the traditional way that the game might be played. So even if you're playing in, say, uh, you know, uh, D&D 5e or Savage Worlds or whatever, going with this route of saying, you know, for the Kaiju of saying, you know, instead of having a direct HP confrontation, use hazards like this and, you know, set things this way and set it up this way and, you know, sort of paint these types of pictures for your players and, you know, run these bizarre, strange, unorthodox combats pretty much independent of the rules. If your system has mechanics for, you know, rock slides and, and eruptions and gale force winds, then you can probably adapt running a kaiju in that system. And that is just, you know, sort of the tip of the iceberg because a lot of these creatures, maybe specifically, you know, whatever game system you're playing doesn't have a mosquito witch or a sandpoint devil, that's okay. They probably have something that's relatively similar and then you could adapt all of this cool lore, the lead up, the, you know, histories and where they fit into the world to this other creature. So that even if you're not using the stat block, you're still using these several pages of world building just around this monster so that you can create something that's really compelling and unique at your table. That said, I do run Pathfinder 2nd Edition, uh, so there's a lot of really awesome monsters in here that I cannot wait to throw at my players. Um, as always, the Pathfinder monsters are very dramatic in combat. They have a lot of cool abilities, and they, uh, you know, including you know, the unique reactions and things like that. And, you know, they're not just stacks of hit points using slam attacks and a breath attack sort of thing. They have some really cool tricks. And from what I've seen, these feel like they're even dialed up a little bit above that as well, just in terms of the options. And it makes sense. These are supposed to be something that's built up to. So you want to make sure that, you know, it's going to live up to that sort of build up. And I think they do. So that's it for uh, Pathfinder Lost Omens Monsters of Myth for second edition. I can't recommend it enough. It really is. I know that I, you know, always gush on the Lost Omens line. Um, and again, it's just because I historically, as a home brewer, I haven't had a lot of need for lore books because I have my own world of lore. Uh, but the folks over at Pfizer do a really good job of making it things that are both complete and you know part of their tapestry, but also that you can use in your own. And I am over the moon with this book. Uh, if we get if they release one of these a year, I would be very happy. I don't know how feasible that is. If you're watching Paizo, do something like this once a year. I think it's better than bestiaries now that we've got three full bestiaries already out. I think that this could be a really cool way to go for introducing more monsters to your system. Um, so that's it. What do you think? Do you have this book? It's certainly been out for a while, since December. Um, again, apologize, I apologize for the delay. Um, but let me know what you think. If, what's your favorite monster in here? You know, have you used it? How did that go? Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Welcome to the Collective.